Hello and welcome to this video in which we will examine the evolution of the Sydney to Albury Road from a rough bush track to a four-laned highway. Prior to 1928, the Hume Highway was known as the Great Southern Road, the Argyle Road, and in southern areas of New South Wales as Port Phillip Road and Sydney Road. In 1928, the New South Wales Main Roads Board adopted the principle of giving each important state highway the same name throughout its length. After consultation with the Country Roads Board of Victoria, which had previously used the name North Eastern Highway for the route, it renamed the inland route from Sydney to Melbourne as the Hume Highway, a tribute to explorer Hamilton Hume. Much of the present highway is roughly along the path followed by the Human Hovel Expedition of 1824. Exploration southwest of Sydney was slow. Beyond Liverpool, the going became progressively more challenging. The eastern edge of the Great Dividing Range has steep escarpments. To ascend to the plateau southwest of Campbelltown, explorers had to follow a geological feature known as the Bargo Ramp. On screen is a New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife view of bushland looking back northeast towards the skyline of Sydney. Once on the plateau, dense forest and deep gorges were difficult to penetrate. Any settlement would have to wait await the construction of a suitable access track, which in the early 1800s was beyond the colony's resources. Travel overland from Sydney towards Albury and what was until 1851 the Port Phillip District of New South Wales was incredibly challenging. For much of the way it meant travelling a rough track and before bridges, fording rivers and creeks. It often meant carts stuck in bogs up to, up to their axles. To set the scene, here's an extract from the Sydney Morning Herald of August 26, 1859, headed from our special Goldfields reporter. A mile below Jugiong, the Murrumbidgee makes a large detour. When the road leaves the flat, and ascends the broken ridges that form the southern termination of the tableland to the northward. You are now on Cooney's Hill, and the track passes over side lengths crossed by an indefinite number of small ravines. And here commences seven miles of the worst and most difficult road in the colony. You commence the descent passing over mud holes that would engulf a bullock, and now you are in black soil flat, floundering knee deep in mud. And then comes Cooney's Creek, and then more hills and more mud traps and more black clay flats. And then the black springs, the terror of bullock drivers. And then the worst of all, the money, money ranges, across which a rough trench has been excavated, intended as a road, but which is now converted into one long mud hole in which, for two miles, drays sink to the axle in rotten granite, and clay as tenacious as pitch. Having arrived at the base of the last and steepest hill, without the necessity of having my horse dug out of the mud, I reached Money Money Station, the first house after leaving Jugiong in crossing the range. So that was from the Sydney Morning Herald of August 26, 1859. Travelling conditions by road improved quite slowly as preference was given to spending public funds on completion of the Great Southern Railway that arrived in Albury from Sydney in 1881. On screen is an illustration from the Illustrated Sydney News, a depiction of what Albury looked like in 1881. On the left of the illustration, the artist has shown a train approaching an Albury railway station that was far from complete. A letter signed by a Queenslander, 
in the Brisbane Telegraph of January 13, 1880, described the arriving in Albury by road. Germanton, that was a town which was renamed Holbrook after World War I. Germanton is the halting place to change coaches and drivers. After tea, the night coach for Albury takes its departure at 8pm. Great coats and muffs are now brought to the fore and appreciated. Woe betide that man who has not got one. The coach arrives at its destination about 1am, having run the distance of 45 miles in about five hours, including stoppages. Upon arriving at Albury, we go to the Globe Hotel, where the coach pulls up and you will find a most sumptuous spread laid out and attendants with snow white aprons and beaming faces ready to assist in making glad the heart of man. You have no time to waste here. The coach comes round again at 5am to take intending passengers for Melbourne to the Wodonga railway station. Wodonga is co-joined to Albury by a wooden structure called a bridge over the Murray or Hume River. In comparing Albury time with that of Wodonga, at first sight, a curious fact presents itself. There is a difference of 28 minutes. But upon further consideration, this is easily accounted for by the difference in longitude between Sydney and Melbourne, giving Sydney the advantage of 28 minutes. Albury is a very picturesque town and is the capital of the far famed Albury wine producing district. Anyone with a soul for rural scenery would be amply repaid by a stay of a day or two there. So that was from a Queenslander in the Brisbane Telegraph. The first definitive record of a road being constructed from Sydney to the south is the construction of a section between Sydney and Liverpool commissioned by Governor Macquarie and built by ex-convict William Roberts. The contract stipulated that the road shall be 33 feet, that's about 10 metres, wide, with three rods, about 15 metres, of ground on either side felled, and that it was to include all bridges necessary to be erected thereon whether the said bridges be big or small. On completion of the road, the Sydney Gazette reported, the new road leading to Liverpool, constructed by Mr. William Roberts, being completed a few days ago, His Excellency, the Governor, accompanied by Lieutenant Governor Mole, was pleased to go thither on Tuesday last, the 22nd instant, and perform the ceremony of opening it, on which occasion the barriers at the bridge, which had been suffered to remain until then, were immediately removed to make way for His Excellency's carriage. We understand that His Excellency expressed much satisfaction with the general line and performance of this important public work, and was particularly struck with the appearance of Moore's Bridge, which is at once bold, strong and workmanlike, extending across a wide, steep and beautiful reach of Prospect Creek. The several other bridges, though of inferior extent to Moore's Bridge, also met His Excellency's approbation. The extent of this road from the place where it branches off from the road leading to Parramatta at about five miles from Sydney, to its termination at Liverpool on George's River, is 19 miles, the whole of which distance His Excellency travelled in his carriage, and it may now be, of course, considered ready for all the intercourses for which it was intended. Leading thus to the fertile settlements on George's River, it will render incalculable benefits to the settlers there by enabling them to send their various produce to market by a safe and ex expeditious line of conveyance, instead of, as heretofore, harassing their cattle and breaking their carts through the rugged and intricate passes of the bush. It will be likewise of great advantage to the new settlements of Aids, Appen, and Bring, Bring Jelly on the River Nepean, 
by rendering their distances from Sydney several miles shorter and in many degrees better than by the present road through Parramatta. It is said to be in contemplation to erect a toll gate very shortly on this road near to Moores Bridge where we may venture to assert that a moderate toll will not be more readily demanded than cheerfully and gratefully paid. The road engineer for this project, William Roberts, was the four times great grandfather of Aubrey and District His Historical Society member Paul Keane. And Paul points out that, and I'm quote from Paul, for his work on the Hume Highway and New South Head Road, Roberts was granted 200 acres at Bondi. A map of that land showed that Roberts was probably the first European owner of Bondi Beach foreshore. He sold it in the 1850s for about 500 pounds. On screen is a photo of a roadside milestone that has been preserved in Liverpool. The first sandstone milestones in New South Wales were located on the Parramatta, Liverpool and South Head roads from 1816 on the instructions of Governor Macquarie. The Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser of May 18, 1816 reported that tolls were imposed coming out of Sydney to defray the weighty expense attending the construction of the said roads and at the same time to, to form a fund for their necessary repair. Located at the Turnpike Gate at Moores Bridge on the Liverpool Road. Moores Bridge crossed Crooks River. Details of tolls charged are shown in the table. For example, every head of cattle cost one pence. For every score, that is 20, of sheep or pigs, five pence. Every horse, one and a half pence, and up to one shilling and six pence for a four-wheeled carriage drawn by four horses. Tolls were still in place as late as 1861. The Aubrey Banner informed its readers that in September of that year, the government have at length decided on establishing tolls on the 1st of October at Picton Bridge, at Berrima, at Torang Pass, and at Cooney's Hill, leaving Jugion on the Great Southern Road. The article goes on to point out, in all cases where toll has been paid at one turnpike gate, no toll shall be payable on the same account and on the same day at any of the turnpike gates within a distance of 10 miles from the former. And all turnpike gates may be repassed any number of times the same day without payment of any fresh toll. In August 1814, Hamilton Hume and his younger brother John became the first white men to cross the Razorback Range from Appen to Stone Quarry, which was later renamed Picton. In 1818, Hamilton Hume and surveyor James Meehan surveyed the area between Liverpool and districts now known as Mossvale, Maroolan and Goulburn to reveal promising lands to the south. Governor Macquarie encouraged settlement in the new country Therefore, a new road was necessary to be constructed by convict labour. The earliest reference to this road is in a letter from Governor Macquarie to Commissary General Drennan, dated 9th of September 1819, where, where instructions were given for the construction of a cart road through the country as far as the settlement about to be established there. He was referring to a new settlement on the Goulburn Plains. Work commenced the following month and was completed in February 1821. The road was 120 kilometres long 
and its average width about 10 metres, although only a single cart width may have been properly cleared of stumps and rocks. The road reached to Wollandilly River, northeast of present-day Goulburn, and had several lengths of steep grade, many river and creek crossings, and a poor quality of construction. In 1832, approval was given to construct a road along a new line surveyed in 1830 by Surveyor General Major Thomas Mitchell. The new line of road was 34 kilometres shorter and of much better construction quality. In September 1833, the Great Southern Road was listed to be kept in repair at the public expense. Note in the table that there's no mention of the road beyond Goulburn. Government funding only extended as far as Goulburn. South of Goulburn, the road to the Port Phillip crossing place, that is Albury, for much of the distance remained little more than just a track. Convict labour continued to be used from 1836 to 1842 as work progressed. In 1842, the Turang Stockade housed up to 250 convicts engaged in construction of what had become known as the Great Southern Road. The garrison at Taurang comprised one officer, two sergeants, three corporals with up to 40 privates. This is a photo of the convict built masonry bridge constructed across Taurang Creek and opened in 1839. It is still visible today from the Derrick VC rest area on the Hume Highway. Travellers on the Great Southern Road faced many hazards and not just the poor road conditions and river crossings. Bush rangers, some of them escaped convicts from the Taurang stockade, preyed upon travellers. John Hume, who had accompanied his brother, Hamilton, in earlier expeditions southwest of Sydney, was killed by bush rangers at Gunning in January 1840. In November 1835, a correspondent to the Sydney Morning Herald wrote asking for greater police presence on the Great South Road, and he wrote, From the district of Camden to that of Goulburn, many robberies have certainly been committed on account of its being so very thinly inhabited and of so great an extent, yet greatly used both by persons on horseback and by teams richly laden. In the event of a robbery, robbers have time to secrete themselves or their plunder in the almost impenetrable scrubs in those neighbourhoods. To give some idea of the time taken to travel the route in the 1830s, it is useful to look at mail deliveries. Prior to 1938, postal communication between Sydney and Melbourne was by sailing ship. Problems with that service led to the introduction of an overland mail service. The first Sydney to Melbourne overland mail, carried by John Conway Burke, working for John Horden, crossed the Murray River near Howlong in 1838. Albury was declared the official crossing place of the Murray River later in 1838. In October 1839, the Government Gazette invited tenders for the mail run from Sydney to Melbourne and return. The mail was to leave the Sydney General Post Office at 5pm every Saturday, arrive in Goulburn, 120 miles away, at 8pm Sunday, depart Goulburn at 6am the next morning, arriving at Yass, 54 miles away, by 4pm, depart Yass at 5am Tuesday, Arrive Gundigai, 65 miles away, at 6pm. Depart 
Gundy Guy at 6am Wednesday to arrive in Albury 129 miles away on Thursday evening. The trip of 373 miles would take five and a half days from Sydney to Albury. Then the Marlman would leave Albury on Friday morning at 6am to arrive in Melbourne by noon on Monday. The, re the return mail would leave Melbourne at noon on Thursday and travel back reaching Sydney nine days later. The whole journey taking 21 days. The Marlman would then be given nine hours rest before heading off again. William Rutledge was awarded the mail contract for the sum of £1,450. What started as a horseback service was replaced by a two-horse cart in 1843. The Philately from Australia journal recorded in March 1998 that the overland mail was often subject to delays, usually through flooding, as four major rivers had to be crossed. Aborigines who had at the outset been a hazard to the mailmen were later helpful in pro providing canoes to carry the mail across swollen rivers. Back to the story of the road. By 1847, the Great Southern Road had extended beyond Goulburn to Yass. And in 1854, the Yass River Bridge was completed. What appears in the photo as a reasonably good dirt road continued southwest towards Gundagai. This is the new bridge at Yass, which dates from about 1876 and remained as part of the Hume Highway until Yass was bypassed in 1994. The Government Gazette of June 29, 1858 proclaimed three main roads under the Main Roads Management Act, including the Great Southern Road, which was described as being from the Great Western Road at the fifth milestone from Sydney via Liverpool, Camden, Berrima, Goulburn, Yass and Gundagai to Albury. Note that previously it had been defined as continuing, continuing only as far as Goulburn. Control of the road was assumed by the Department of Public Works in 1861. At that time, a fair amount of coarse gravel surfacing had been carried out between Sydney and Goulburn, although the surface was still not very good. In 1867, the 922-metre Prince Alfred Bridge crossing the Murrumbidgee River and floodplain was completed at Gundagai. Unfortunately, this historic bridge was neglected and became unsafe. It was demolished in November 2021. Apart from improved river crossings, from Gundagai to Albury, very little construction work had been undertaken and the road remained nothing but a dirt track the southward expansion of the rail system during the 1860s and 1870s became a more important priority than road construction and maintenance. After completion of the Great Southern Rail to Albury in 1881, more resources could be allocated to road construction and maintenance. The photo here shows workers in about 1895 close to Bona Township, just north of Albury, working on what is probably the Great Southern Road. Here we see the Great Southern Road at Bona in about 1895. William Boundy, licensee of the White Horse Inn behind, is on the cart. Note the coarse gravel surface. The road is now under Lake Hume and is usable when the lake is low and remains in quite good condition. Travel by coach was considerably improved with the arrival of 23-year-old Freeman Cobb from the US in 1853. He introduced an improved coach 
with rounded, lightweight and supple bodies resting on leather straps. This gave a more comfortable ride than the previous steel sprung coaches. He also placed changing stations about every 10 to 20 miles or so along routes. Fresh horses meant the coaches would, could maintain high speeds across long distances. For example, the first changing station after leaving Albury heading north was at Bona, about 12 miles to the north. Drivers would sound a bugle about one mile out from the change station to alert the groom who would have a fresh team of horses brushed and harnessed by the time the coach rolled in. By 1870, there was a six times per week coach service linking Albury to a rail terminus at Goulburn for train to Sydney. Typically, coaches would be drawn by four to eight horses and could carry up to six inside and 12 outside, plus the Royal Mail and the passenger's luggage. Fares seem rather expensive. For example, the fare from Albury to Wagga was two pounds in 1876. The droughts of the late 1800s and early 1900s caused the cost of feed to skyrocket for the thousands of horses used by coaching companies. In the period 1898 to 1902, Cobb & Co's bill came to £70,000, which in today's money is about $12 million. There was competition from railways as, and as rail lines extended, coaches were transferred to feeder routes, timetable to link in with the trains. The arrival of motor transport saw the horse-drawn coaching industry collapse in the early decades of the 20th century. The arrival of the motor car in the early 1900s rejuvenated efforts to upgrade Australian roads. With the passing of the Main Roads Act of 1924, the Great Southern Road became eligible for assistance from Main Roads funds from the state government. Improvement of the Great Southern Road in the south of the state remained sluggish, as illustrated in an Aubrey Banner article of September 1926, in which the paper told readers, Although the local government bodies in both Victoria and New South Wales are assisted to maintain the main roads by grants from the government and by independent work by the roads boards, the minor roads in the border districts are on the whole in a far better condition than the, than the Great Southern Road. Shire councils right through to the capital are disinclined to spend the ratepayers' money in the maintenance of roads which in the main are used by three through traffic, which does not contribute to the local rates. As recorded in the Government Gazette of New South Wales dated 17th of August 1928, the Great Southern Road was declared a state highway and renamed the Hume Highway. During the Great Depression years from the late 1920s, Several projects on the Hume Highway were funded by the Unemployment Relief Works Program. A wide range of capital works were funded aimed at providing work for the unemployed. As a result of these projects, the state governments were taking more responsibility for major roads. By the early 1940s, the Hume Highway had improved considerably and had been sealed over the full length from Sydney to Melbourne. The Border Morning Mail reported in December 1940, for many years past, citizens of Albury have been used to hearing unstinted praise from travellers regarding the excellence of the highway between Melbourne and Albury. It is refreshing now to hear travellers from Sydney speaking in the same way of the highway from Sydney to Albury. There now remains only a few short sections of unpaved road in the 565 miles between Sydney and Melbourne. We have a few slides now coming up showing progress on the road. 
This first one shows road construction on the Razorback near Picton in, 18, in 1929. Here we have two images from 1938. They suggest that these sections are still little better than a dirt track. In both photos, the road appears to be winding between property boundaries. The left-hand one is two miles north of Yass. The second one is between Gundagai and Tarkutta. Here we see a cutting between Gundagai and Tarkata. The left hand one was taken in 1938 before work was done. The right hand one was taken in 1939 after an upgrade. Here we see road construction near Tarkata in 1939. In 1956, there was a photographic survey undertaken of road conditions along the Hume Highway. These are a few photos from that survey, all taken south of Gundigai. Cars had to often share the road with travelling stock. Another 1956 photo, accidents involving trucks were very common. In August of 1954, Route 31 signs began to appear across the full length of the highway as part of a national numbering scheme for major roads. In 1974, construction and maintenance of the road truly became a national project when the federal government took responsibility for its funding. They embarked on a program to make the highway a dual carriageway along its entire length from Sydney to Melbourne. With the opening of bypasses of Tarkata and Wamagama in 2011 and Holbrook in 2013, the Hume Highway completed its evolution into the modern high standard road that we see today, a major freight route and a critical part of the nation's transportation infrastructure. The first Sydney to Melbourne trip by car was via Bathurst in May 1900 by Herbert Thompson in his Thompson Motor Phaeton. His time travelling was 58 hours and 6 minutes. The Albury Banner reported, The first appearance of a motor car in Albury took place on Saturday and aroused a good deal of interest. This car is driven by steam. The motive power is generated by kerosene, four gallons of which are sufficient for a run of 100 miles. A Mullingandra correspondent noted Thompson going through and told readers of the banner, On Saturday last, the residents of our quiet little village were surprised to see a rather elaborate looking carriage containing a couple of gentlemen wending its way at a good pace along the Sydney Road. The carriage was without horses, and its advance was viewed with a considerable amount of apprehension by a number of schoolboys playing cricket on the road, who made haste out of its way. It proved to be one of the much talked of motor cars, and it was, a, and it was greatly admired by all who saw it. No doubt, at some not very far away future day, it will be no novelty to see a motor car on the Sydney Road. The motor car era had begun, but it was another half century before personal car ownership became common. Apart from trucks, most road travel was by coach, taking over from the stagecoach runs of the 19th century. Though horses remained common, as did travelling stock. In October 1929, Harold Beath of Albury lowered the Sydney to Melbourne record. Beath had a garage and Dodge dealership in Swift Street, Albury. He had previously held the record in 1927 and 1928. The Wagga Daily Advertiser reported, 
the motor car record from Melbourne to Sydney has been lowered by H.J. Beath of Albury, who, with his mechanic, A. Dolphin of Melbourne, covered the 570 miles in 10 hours, 12 minutes. Beath left the Melbourne GPO at 5.01 a.m. and after striking trouble with flocks of sheep near Goulburn, which necessitated a detour, he arrived at, in Sydney at 3.13 p.m. At one stage it was necessary to remove the radiator to adjust the fan belt and this cost him 45 minutes. The Chrysler at times exceeded 100 miles per hour that's about 161 kilometres per hour, and average 56.47 miles per hour, that is 91 kilometres per hour, for the whole of the journey. The record later fell to 8 hours and 56 minutes, a time that would be hard to achieve in the 21st century. Two motorists were killed in a 1930 record attempt, and in the mid-1930s, New South Wales Police banned record attempts on public roads. Through the 1930s, road accident fatality numbers were increasing in New South Wales. In 1934, there were 319 killed on New South roads. And by 1937, the number had climbed to 576 persons killed. The rising toll prompted action to make New South Wales roads safer. In December 1937, New South Wales introduced a speed limit of 30 miles per hour, that's about 48 kilometres per hour, in built up areas, and 50 miles per hour, that is 80 kilometres per hour, on country roads. The Border Morning Mail noted in January 1938 that police applauded the new laws, commenting that police officers have long been concerned by the danger threatened by heavy traffic in Dean Street, and previously the only restriction imposed on the motorist, motorist was the rather indefinite instruction that he should not drive to the danger of the public. Just two months later, the Border Morning Mail reported what they call the worst accident in the history of the border district. Five were killed in late March when a bus collided with a car on the Murray Valley Highway west of Wodonga. The fatalities were all in the car and included two Albury married couples. Let's have a look at the various highway routes through Albury over time. The colonial surveyor Thomas Townsend produced the first map of the Albury Township in 1839. The map shows a narrow track striking out northeast from the corner of Wodonga Place and Hume Street. It is labelled to Sydney. The early Sydney road passed through the township of Bona, now drained by Lake Hume. The road ran basically north to south from Plunkett's Road in the north to what is now Bona Waters Reserve. From Bona Township, Sydney Road travelled through Thaguna before entering Albury. In Albury, during the middle years of the 19th century, the road, then known as Sydney Road, made a series of turns to reach the western end of Hovel Street, the location of the punt across the Murray River, then after 1861 to the first Union Bridge, which opened that year. The Border Post reported in October 1859 that the Sydney Road be defined as passing through Sydney Street, that's now Barella Road, Broad Street, Wilson Street, Keywar Street, Dean Street, Townsend Street, Neuragong Street and Wodonga Street to the site of the projected bridge. When the railway arrived in 1881, that route crossed the rail line at Wilson Street. The construction of the Guinea Street Bridge across the rail line in 1887 
rerouted Sydney Road along Guinea Street to Olive Street, then down to Dean Street. Follow the Green Line on the map. The completion of the Hume Dam in the mid-1930s brought about a major change to the road north of Albury. The highway from Sydney was diverted through Tabletop with Wagga Road and Mate Street becoming the new route for traffic travelling south into and north out of Albury. When Young Street was formed, southbound traffic turned left of what was still known as Sydney Road into Young Street, then right at the eastern end of Dean Street, along most of the length of the main street, before turning left into Townsend Street. Follow the blue line on the map. However, it was not always clear if the highway should follow Dean Street or should it follow Smollett Street. The Main Roads Board re recommended in a report of November 1929 that motorist, travel motorist travelling through Albury should take Smollett Street, which they described as the most convenient route through Albury to the border, rather than the highway along Dean Street. The Border Morning Mail preferred the Dean Street route, commenting that it is a matter of regret that the best streets of Albury should be missed. Smollett Street was reject rejected and never became part of the route. The highway continued to turn right at Dean Street. However, many continued to use Smollett Street as their preferred route. For many years, truck drivers in particular avoided Dean Street. In May 1950, Albury City Council carried a motion by Alderman Gelbart for a report to be submitted by the engineer on the practicability and advisability of having Hume Highway diverted from Dean Street to Smollett Street. He said the reason behind this was to try and eliminate noise caused by heavy transports passing Albury Hospital and to lessen traffic along Dean Street. Alderman King warned that such a move would carry more traffic past schools in Smollett Street. Young Street was extended south beyond Smollett Street in the early 1960s and the Hume Highway then turned right into Hume Street before turning south into Wodonga Place. Follow the orange line on the map. For many years, up until 1962, Dean Street remained part of the Hume Highway. Note the sign outside Maple's store from the 1950s on the corner of Dean and Townsend Streets, directing traffic to turn left for Melbourne. As described earlier, the solution did not come until 1962 when Young Street was extended from Smollett Street to Hume Street, with the Hume Highway then following Young Street before turning west into Hume Street, then onto Wodonga Place. Until the opening of the Hume Freeway through Albury in March 2007, Albury remained the only section of the Hume Highway between Sydney and Melbourne where traffic had to negotiate and make right-hand turns, Albury had five such turns as traffic made its way from Wodonga to the north of Albury. The Hume Freeway reduced congestion and travel times between Albury and Wodonga by removing up to 40,000 vehicles per day from the Lincoln Causeway between Albury and Wodonga. The freeway bypassed 18 sets of traffic lights and five right angle bends that through traffic had previously encountered.